everyone, how's it going? This is going to be the next part in the Earth Science Final Review Master Overview Series. I'm going to do part 4 today. Please watch part 1, 2, and 3 before part 4. I will put the link into the description for all of those parts. Also, here are the specific videos for each topic. This is an overview video, so it's not going to explain things as specific as these videos did. So there's 32 of these specific videos. If you need help specifically on a unit, that's where you go. I will also link this in the playlist. On that note, here we go. We're on rocks and minerals today. There are five characteristics that you need to know for something to be a mineral. It has to be a solid, inorganic, orderly internal structure, also has to be formed naturally, so it cannot have been man-made, and it has to have a demo definite chemical composition, so that's like it has to have some sort of chemical formula. Minerals are made of elements. There are a lot of them, and 60% of them are silicates, which means they have silicon and oxygen in their chemical formula. There, the silicate minerals also are shaped in this tetrahedron pattern, which looks like a pyramid. And it's got a silicon ion in the center with four oxygen ions at the corners. The internal arrangement of atom gives all the physical properties of the mineral. So the shape, the hardness, the breakage pattern, anything to do with physical characteristics. You have to know how to read this chart. So again, here's your, your chemical formulas here. So if you look like SiO2 quartz, that's a silicate. Here's your elements on the bottom. And again, I'm not going into how to read this chart go check out my minerals video and you can get a tutorial on that. We got our streak test. This is the powder left behind on a streak plate. It's the true color of the mineral. So it's a really good test. We got the luster test, which is how light reflects off the surface. We can have metallic or non-metallic for luster. We have the hardness test, which is the resistance to being scratched. Remember, it could scratch anything equal to or less. So if I'm looking at this chart on the left right here, like if I pick calcite, calcite can scratch gypsum and talc, but it can also scratch another calcite. Then we got the breakage pattern. Cleavage means it could break in a smooth side, at least one smooth side right here. So like this example here, or the flat sheets, or like a stair step. Fracture is just random, jagged, no pattern at all. All right, now we got rocks. So igneous rocks form from volcanoes. They can either form uh, above ground on lava from lava or underground from magma. Extrusive rocks cool really quickly on the surface and intrusive rocks cool slowly underground. And this is gonna be the major thing for igneous. You have to know how to read the igneous rock chart. Again, not explaining it here. What is only in igneous rocks? So you can have intergrown crystals, glassy texture and vesicular texture. You should know how to read this particle size to water velocity chart. I'm not explaining it here. It's in the other video, so go check it out. The rock cycle chart. This is a great chart to just be able to know how to read it. So just follow the arrows. The arrows point to the process that creates the rock that it's pointing to. So like, for example, starting from sedimentary rock, if you put it under heat and pressure, it makes metamorphic rocks. Then we got different types of sedimentary rock. So if it's clastic, that means it's made of pieces of other rock. And the rock is named by the size of the clasts. So the big one is like conglomerate and it's all this is all in the reference table. It's right here. Conglomerate, breccia, sandstone, siltstone, shale in order of grain size. Grain size means the size of the pieces inside of it. Horizontal sorting means when a river deposits into a lake or an ocean, it will drop off the biggest particle first and then the medium particles and the small particles will go out the furthest because they weigh less so the water is able to carry them further. We got some sedimentary rock characteristics. These you have to just memorize. So sedimentary rocks have fossils and imprints, ripple marks, pieces of other rocks, and layering. Metamorphic rocks form from heat and or pressure. If it's contact metamorphism, this is when the rock is close enough to the magma chamber where it's changed, but not close enough where it's going to melt into an igneous rock. So we want it to just be near enough to feel the heat, essentially, to metamorphosize it. Here are the four characteristics of metamorphic rocks. We got mineral alignment, we got foliated or non-foliated, we got banding and distorted structure. 
All right, we're on the next unit. Here we go for Wedgel. So I, I just named this unit Wedgel. You, depending on your school, you might name it something else. So it's Weathering, Erosion, Deposition, Glaciers, and Landscapes. Here we go. Physical Weathering. So changes in the appearance or form of the material, but it doesn't change into a different substance. So you're just changing what it looks like. So we got frost action when the, fr the water gets into cracks, it freezes and then expands when it freezes. So this happens over and over again and it makes the cracks really big. So in order to have this, you need to be in an environment where it can get below freezing and above freezing. We got abrasion. This is rocks hitting into other rocks somehow. So they can be rubbed into the rock or smashed into them by mostly wind or water. Rocks that are weathered by water specifically tumble along the bottom of the, the floor or get hit by other rocks and the, the edges chip off and it rounds and smooths them. And obviously if the edges are getting chipped off, it's also going to decrease them in size. We got chemical weathering. So oxidation, this means to rust. So rust is a new chemical. Temperature, things that usually dissolve better when it's hotter. So things that are hot dissolve fast. If you crush something, they're going to dissolve faster. So this is called increasing the surface area. Mineral composition, things that are harder in hardness are going to take longer to break down, like quartz. Warm and moist environment gives you the most chemical weathering. We got some soil. The top soil is where you get the humus layer. That's that organic layer where all the plants are dying, essentially. So that's only going to be there if the environment can harbor plants and vegetation. So if it's really arid or dry, you're not going to have a humus layer of topsoil. And the most important factor in determining the soil is the climate of the area. That means it's like pretty much if it's dry or moist. All right, infiltration. This is going to be a lot of vocab here. So this is where water soaks into the ground. The water table, this is the boundary between the zone of saturation and the zone of aeration. Essentially, it's the top of the water under, under the ground. If there is a steep slope, you would have low amount of infiltration because the, the water is just flying down the hill, so it doesn't have time to seep into the ground. Porosity, this is the percentage of pore space in between the sediment. So water gets stuck essentially between the dirt particles, and the more space there are between the particles, the more water that it can be held. So the packing makes a big difference. The more packed the particles are, this is going to be less space, so less porosity. If the particles are sorted, like the first picture, you got a lot of space. But if you intermix different sized particles, they're going to take up those spaces, so lower porosity there. This is like the one question where it's equal. So if you have equal volume right here, but different size, same shape, this is going to be equal porosity, all three of those. Then we got permeability, how fast the water can go through the sediment. So if something's permeable, it allows water to pass through it. So the bigger the particles, the bigger the space between the particles. So it's got better permeability. Capillary action is when the material goes upwards through the sediment. So the sm it works best in the smallest size particles. We got pollution. All you got to know about pollution is that pollution's bad. It destroys plants and animal life. Then we got erosion. It's the transport of sediments from one location to another. What causes them? Landslides, avalanches. This is going to be from gravity. These are called mass movements. We got wind. Wind is mostly going to be your agent of erosion in arid areas where there's not that much vegetation. We got some dunes. You should know how the shape of the dune works. The, the gradual side has the wind coming towards it, and then the steep side is where the wind's going towards. Rivers carve out V-shaped valleys. The letter V is in the word river. The fastest flowing water in the stream is the area with the least friction. So this is going to be the area. Now, this is assuming we're not on a curve. That's completely different. In a straight river, this is going to be the area where in the gray where it's fastest because it's not rubbing against anything. Larger sediment carried by a glacier can create parallel scratches called striations in rock surface. 
we got glacial erratics, which are giant boulders that are dropped off by a glacier because they're so heavy. Glaciers make U-shaped valleys. Remember, rivers make V-shaped valleys. Glaciers make U. Stream discharge just means the volume of water moving down the stream. So it's how much water is in the, the river. The mouth is where it empties out. So the more water in the river, the faster the river will flow. It's like more power. The faster the river goes, the bigger the particle size it can move. Then we got the different types of river valleys. So youthful valleys generally have faster water because they're so steep. Mature valleys are less steep, but they'll have more tributaries. They'll start meandering. They'll get floodplains. They widen out. They have some oxbow lakes, which are cut off meanders. All right, this is what I was saying before. On the outside of a curve, the water is the fastest. So that's where all your erosion is going to be. So that's the right side of this picture over here. I tell my students it looks like a Nike swoosh, like on a sneaker. And like the, the swish part is where the erosion is. That would be the outside of the curve. The slowest part, the inside of the curve, it's so slow that all of the material is deposited there. So we said this, this is horizontal sorting. I'm going to go, go on. So glaciers, we got valley glaciers, which are in a mountain, essentially, or continental glacier, which is just a giant ice sheet like Antarctica. Glaciers create angular and sharp features. They're all unsorted. A moraine is a pile of unsorted sediment created by a glacier. We got a drumlin, which is known as an elongated hill. This is a depositional feature of a glacier. And the pointy part shows the direction the river, uh, not the river, the glacier is moving. Then we got an outwash plain, the only sorted part or feature of a glacier. So the glacier melts at the bottom and it creates a giant lake generally called an outwash plain. And this sorts particles. We can have a kettle lake. This is when a giant piece of ice pushes down into the ground. It melts and fills with water. The finger lakes on the reference table were formed from glaciers. They moved from the north to the south. Then we got some beach stuff. Longshore current. The waves strike the beach at an angle, so it causes sand to move down the beach. We got groins and jetties. These are giant walls that they help prevent beach erosion. They grow the beach back. And a barrier island down here protects our coastline from storms and hurricanes. So you should know how to read these landscape maps. Uh, uplifting forces means that mountains are being formed, so the landscape's going up. And leveling force means it's getting eroded or it's getting flattened. So that's going to be your plains or plateaus. Plateaus are not only considered flat, they can also be considered rolling hills. Plains are definitely flat. They have a lot of meandering streams on them. Here's a nice little chart. Humid versus arid climates in what the, the landscape would look like if you look at the picture. Humid climates are gentle, fertile land, and chemical weathering. And then arid climates are steep, rocky, and physical weathering. This is like a desert versus a rainforest, essentially. Then we got your four stream drainage patterns. You should be able to identify these on different pictures. Here are the only four you need to know. So if you need to pause it and just look at it, you can. And that finishes Wedgel. All right, so that was part four, which means there's going to be a part five to this. I'm actually going to record it directly after this. So good luck on your tests, and I will see you in part five. Bye.